All right, welcome, my friends, to episode 674 of Extreme Health Radio. Okay, so it looks like we're streaming, which is great. That's working. We're not being censored as of yet for this live stream. So I appreciate that. Let me uh, turn the music down a little bit. I hope you guys are doing great wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. If you're new to the show, we broadcast every Friday morning at 10.45 a.m. Pacific time. And we're like one minute late today. So this is a, this is a complete record for us. So I'm, I'm super happy that we're uh, <laughs> as on time as we are today. Uh, today we got Daniel Vitalis on and a longtime friend of the show doing some awesome work. I'm wearing one of his shirts here that if you're watching on video, you can see from Sir Thrival. Um, love his products. And there's actually a sale going on right now, which I'll mention later on in the show. But if you guys want to grab the show notes uh, for today's show, um, you can get everything at extremehealthradio.com forward slash 674. And I wanted to have Daniel on the show today to talk about uh, his latest project, which is not new. It's a couple years old called Wild Fed, and um, it's an awesome, awesome work that he's doing. Um, and we're talking just before we started recording um, how apropos it is for our times these days, because now everyone's turning into a prepper because of this uh, big C, little V virus thing going around. So um, this is really, really cool. So I want to turn you on to his work and, and his company, Sir Thrival, and, and talk more about um, what he has going on. Um, like I mentioned, we broadcast every Friday, 1045 AM Pacific time. And let me share with you a couple upcoming guests. We've got a lot of cool people coming up. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have Adam Bergstrom on the show. We'll be talking about mind hacking and body language. Uh, next Friday after that, Dr. Gerald Smith, The Missing Links in Degenerative Diseases, and Dr. Richard Massey, MD, Celebrating Our Origin Stories, and then Morley Robbins, Does Iron Deficiency Anemia Really Exist on Planet Earth? So that's going to be cool, cool, cool stuff. He does a lot of work with the, the Root Cause Protocol, Balancing Bioavailable Copper. Uh, and magnesium in the body and all kinds of cool stuff. So um, we'll be bringing him back on. So Daniel Vitalis, if you guys haven't heard, he's been on our show multiple times. We did a series with him a few years back on earth, air, fire, and water. And we've done a number of other shows with him, but it's been a long time since he's been on. And if you're not familiar with his work, uh, he's the host of Wild Fed, um, which is a really cool, cool, amazing TV show and podcast that he's doing. And let me bring him on the show so you guys can take a look at Daniel, turn his mic on. What's up, Daniel? How's it going, my friend? <laughs> Am I being censored or is this live? <laughs> it is It is live until they censor you. <laughs> yeah, Justin, thanks for having me back on, man. It's been a long time and I'm uh, glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's awesome. So you were telling me before, I think Jesse was telling me through uh, via email that you have, um, you're actually going to be filming something today, right? Something, some friends are coming over. You're going to yeah, film something? Yeah. Yeah. We're doing a squirrel hunt today and uh, processing acorns, which is uh, just like two of my favorite things to eat this time of year. So we'll be working on an episode of that. You know, Wild Fed is uh, going to cable in January. Uh, oh, so no this will be for a follow up season. Yeah. But uh, season one uh, hits cable uh, in a couple of months. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I have to ask you if it's going to cable, does that mean there's going to be any restrictions on what you can do or say, or do you own full right, the ability to kind of, express I'm actually yourself? licensing the show. Uh, so we are not produced by a network. We have self produced it and I are see. then licensing it. So, um, I maintain the trademark, the business, the podcast, all of that. I mean, of course there are, um, you know, there's format stuff. So mm -hmm. we've had to shorten our episodes a little bit. You know, they were 30 minutes. They'll have to be 22 to conform to the format. And there are mm -hmm. things, of course, in good taste that they ask, you know, you not to show when it comes to hunting and fishing. Of right, course, right. Those things that are kind of graphic for folks. Um, but uh, in general, uh, everything is beautiful. I couldn't ask for more, really. The, the situation's perfect. Yeah, I didn't want you to turn into, uh, you know, Joe Rogan moving to Spotify and then getting censored even more. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really talking about things, you know, the world really changed in 2016. I mean, it just rat everything this the climate just changed so much. And I was like, Whoa, I saw that happening. And I backed right off and I've and I shifted gears. I yeah. changed, you know, I was doing a podcast called rewild yourself. Uh -huh. Um, and I decided to end that podcast and start a new show. And what I really wanted to do was get outside of everything that's happening. I mean, I really respect what you're doing, wading into some of this territory, oh, yeah. uh, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not looking to get censored. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the content, uh, thankfully, the content that I'm bringing now, it's, it's, out, it's outside of what's currently in vogue to censor. 
Yeah, it seems like the only thing that would be a real an issue would be like what you're saying before, maybe showing a little bit too much during a hunt or something like that. But that doesn't really have any uh, other. But, but but honestly, we're showing it in such a more tasteful and beautiful way, an artistic way, than I think that that kind of media has been done before. So a lot of people mm -hmm. have never even watched a hunting show, so don't know what the landscape is like for that. Yeah. But we're presenting things in a really beautiful way, and um, you, you know because we bring plant foraging and because we bring ecology and all of that it's it's a really artistic expression of it so yeah i don't i don't see censorship really you know the the big thing and this is something that's funny to me um you know the last time we spoke veganism was still really in vogue you know oh yeah very pot that, that was the thing yeah. and here we are now and what's it now it's the carnivore diet uh -huh. right it's so funny it's like right. Is, am I taking crazy pills? Does anyone see what's going on here? <laughs> you know, yeah. we go from human beings are hunter gatherers. There's really, there's just absolutely no debate. There's no debate to be had. Mm -hmm. The carnivore people, sorry, there's no debate. We're hunter gatherers, not just hunters. Mm -hmm. And vegans, sorry, we're hunters and gatherers. There's just no debate. We know it from anthropology. We know it from archaeology. We know it from ethnography. We know that we're hunter gatherers, right? So it's funny because. <clears throat> for a while it was like you can only eat plants that's the only way now it's like you can only eat animals that's the only way it's like tick tock tick i know right uh, you know what i mean <laughs> so um anyway i think if i had come out with a hunting show 10 years ago i think it might have been a little bit different because there was less support grassroots support but now animal foods popular again and because we've had such a back to the land movement and because of all the you know the paleo stuff and and um all of those types of primal diets led mm -hmm. a lot of people to go hey I'm, I'm interested in the source of my food and so hunting now doesn't quite have the look it had a decade ago because there's more people who are saying hey i think i could get with this if this is how i was getting my food or i can support mm -hmm. it when other people do it if they come with the right attitude and they're there to get the food because ultimately it's better Mm -hmm. It's the best way to get your food. Yeah, I want to ask you about the benefits of wild food because most people probably don't even realize that there's something called, you know, wild food and not hybridized animals and stuff like that. But um, are you finding that there's like more of an interest in what you're working on now? Because even if this big C little V thing wasn't going on, we, you know, you still have the trends of the carnivore diet and these types yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with this going on, it seems like everyone's turning into like a prepper now. So it seems like your stuff would be even more relevant, you know? Yeah, it's been a really interesting time, hasn't it? For particularly yeah. for people who've lived a preparedness lifestyle, mm -hmm. because we went, it's sort of like the story of Noah, you know, they all are like laughing at Noah as mm -hmm. he's building this ark, you know, in the biblical story, it had never rained before. So the idea of like building an ark, it made no sense. Right, he's laughed totally. at, he's mocked, right? And yeah. then one day it starts raining and it rains for 40 days and everybody <laughs> who laughed at the prepper was drowned out, you know, obviously in, in this story. So mm -hmm. here we are now in this situation where a lot of us have been like, hey, all the writings on the wall. I mean, this is just the beginning because this isn't the only point of destabilization. You know, it doesn't matter who gets elected. Yeah, it, it matters because in this election we're looking at right now, there's two really dramatic paradigms mm -hmm. um, involved, but, but the crises won't be averted by either of them. Mm -hmm. It's just who do you want steering the boat during the crisis? That's it. Mm -hmm. We're headed for crises on a lot of fronts. And this is just one of them. And um, I think people are finally kind of being shaken out a little bit when they ran out of toilet paper. They were like, oh, this is real. This could happen. Yeah. Um, and then when they started, they, you know, people got very lucky because the food shortages that we did see were very minimal. They were uh -huh. only in certain categories, but it was enough for people to see it could happen. So yeah, there's a huge renewed interest. I think a lot of it's fickle and fleeting because I think a lot of people go like, oh my God, I want to learn how to be a you know an outdoors person now. Right. And then like two weeks into it, they're kind of like, eh, you know, I'm back to Netflix or whatever. But yeah, um, I, I do think it's it's brought a lot of people over to this stuff and there's a huge interest now that wasn't there before. And like you said, the trend lines were already in place mm -hmm. and they will continue to be in place because this way, you know, it's really simple. We've been saying for decades, the way we're living is not sustainable. This is the weirdest thing. It's like an easy equation. If it's not sustainable, then it can't go on. Right. And so when does that happen? Well, it's happening right now. The instability is now revealed mm -hmm. and, um, and it has to change because it's not sustainable. It will have to change to something sustainable or it will have to end. Uh, so as people kind of slowly begin to grasp that their lifestyle is part of that unsustainable thing, there are going to be shifts. And um, maybe I'm 
early still time will tell but people a lot of this stuff i think is going to become more common again yeah it's crazy because um i think there's some videos going around a few months ago maybe four or five months ago with those farmers did you ever see those videos where they were saying you know with like on our farm there's no issue with the food production. We're, what we're having right. an issue with is food distribution. We have all this food yeah. that's literally rotting in the fields where we can't get the cheese mm -hmm. and, the, and the cow, you know, all this material out to people. And that was the lock jam or the log jam. And, um, and so I, I haven't heard much about it lately. Have you with this distribution of food? No, I think that got under control pretty fast, but we did see <clears throat> like for instance, all the hogs being put to death, all the milk being poured out, all those kind of things. That's um, right, yeah. yeah, you know, now I think what we see is, I think we've seen higher prices now on food mm -hmm. and that's another driver for a lot of people. You know, the idea that you can access food and, and it, I mean, it costs your time and it costs the investment of the tools and equipment and training that you need, but to get food the way I'm getting it, it's like, I don't pay for meat anymore. It's yeah, very how sweet nice. Is that? Yeah. It's pretty amazing because I, it's not just like I'm getting the kind of meat that's at the store, I'm getting the best quality meat that exists. Yeah. And yeah. I get to know that meat from through the entire process. Uh -huh. Um, and my hobby, the way I like to spend my free time brings me these foods. So it's really nice because if my hobby was playing poker, let's say, like mm -hmm. I'm not going to be coming home from that with my groceries or, you know, even Actual if it was something food. in the outdoors, right? So my hobby, which gets me in the outdoors and gets me exposed to sunlight and fresh air and clean water, and all those things, forest bathing, I'm getting to do all those things. And then I get to bring home these incredible groceries. And the best part is, you know, like I have company coming over tonight and I'm prepping meals right now, deer, squirrel, turkey, bear. And I get to feed people this incredible food and watch them have experiences that they don't have. You know, you see somebody at a restaurant and they have sometimes really good experiences if the chef's really good. You know, you have that uh -huh. like kind of magical experience of food art. And then if you, let's say you ordered a nice bottle of wine and the sommelier comes out and they tell you about the wine, they tell you where it came from and they start to paint a picture, you mm -hmm. appreciate that wine so much more, right? If a wine shows up at your table and you just drink it, doesn't mean anything to you. Could be a really good one, just doesn't mean anything. Somebody comes out, they start telling you about the place, about the vineyard, about the soil, about the slope and the direction and all that. And suddenly every taste is infused with a story. Mm -hmm. When you went out by canoe and then pulled up on a bank and you harvested the fiddleheads and you brought them home and you processed them and then you pickle them and can them and then you serve those out in a charcuterie or something, man, you've got a whole, that story the impact that that food has on you psychologically is so profound. And if you think about it, here's what's the most interesting to me is that was every human being's lived experience until recently. Every human being for 300,000 years and all the species of Homo before Homo sapiens, our own species, all humans in our genus, we all experienced this until the industrial revolution. We just knew the story of our food and suddenly that story is gone. And so it's like where it's like a kind of like illiteracy or a loss of story or a loss of a language or something. Mm -hmm. People are eating, but they have no story. And you could almost say that that's like one of the essential nutrients and that nutrients now missing. So there's like a deficiency of story behind food. And I think that's why people will pay more if it says grass fed on it. Ever has yeah. a picture of fields, just it's like something, it's something mm -hmm. more than just the package. You just need story because it's supposed to be there. And uh, that's really lacking for people. And that's one of the beautiful things about developing a relationship with wild food. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's so cool. I love doing podcasts like this because like you get, you know how David Wolf used to say, like, sometimes you'll read a book and like, you may just get one sentence out of that book that impacts you, you know, in some, some novel mm -hmm. way. That's really interesting what you just said about the lack of story because we've all heard, especially in the alternative health, you know, nutrition, that you don't want to eat something that has just been butchered in a, in a non-humane way. And it's been, you know, horribly butchered and there's all this drama going on and these emotions being released. And it's just really terrible way to, you know, butcher animals. And so we've heard about this idea of making sure that they're humanely harvested, right? But I think what you're saying is even more interesting, like there's no story or history that we have with that animal or with that livestock mm -hmm. or the, the process of harvesting that. Like, even if you eat grass fed, you're still not getting that, right? Right, yeah, all that's really lacking. And yeah. there, there's more because 
there's direct work involved in the kind of foods I'm talking about. Now, I'm not trying to give the impression this is the only food that I eat. It's just yeah. that we eat it at every meal. We eat wild foods at every meal and not because of like some rule. It's just that all the protein in the house is that and many of mm -hmm. the condiments and canned things and frozen vegetables and sauces and all these things that we make every year come from the fruits of our own labor on the landscape. So there's a story. There's the labor that went into it that adds value in the experience. So it's like, if you and I both brought cranberry sauce to Thanksgiving this year, they're not equivalent for me because <laughs> I picked <laughs> the cranberries from a canoe with my wife and we brought them home and we made the cranberry sauce using the maple syrup as a sweetener that came from the trees that I'm looking at out my window right now. Yeah. I mean, that's you so get, different. You know, that's, I don't care how organic what you bought is or if it was yeah. locally made or any of that. It doesn't matter to me. You can't, it can't, it doesn't, it, it's lacking the soul that the food has when it's gotten in this way. Um, the animals that I eat, like I carried these animals out of the woods That's and I brought insane. them home and I butchered them. And I, you know, I feed my wife this way. I feed my dog this way. I feed myself this way. I feed my friends this way. I feed many animals on my landscape with the parts that I don't use. And so I'm, um, a participant in ecology. And that's probably the biggest thing for me, Justin, is that human beings feel today like they're not part of the ecosystem. You hear it constantly with the way they talk about the environment. We got to mm -hmm. take care of the environment. Right, like, right. Really? Like what, where, what, where are we talking about? What environment are you talking about? And in what yeah. place? Is there a place you go to get food that you want to take care of? Cause it's your kitchen? Or is it just this idea of this place that you're not part of? It'd be like an astronaut being like, we need to save Mars. It's like, you never been there though. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. a lot of people are talking about the environment, but they, they don't have a lived experience or, uh, um, um, uh, they, they don't participate in a extractive way from that environment. Mm -hmm. So all the extraction that's happening for them is happening by surrogates. So there is extraction, fossil fuels and plant fibers and, you know, all those kind of minerals, but they never part of it and participating in it. So the feeling is like, you don't, not only do you not know environments, I don't mean you specifically or any of the listeners, but I'm just saying in general people in general today, modern people, um, they, they don't know the environment itself, but in particular, they don't know anyone who lives in those environments. And when I say anyone, I'm talking about like non-human beings. A living non-human living creatures right so plants animals fungi all of these creatures most people do not know even the animals on their own landscape and really think about that for a second i know it's wild right you could tell me so many you could sit here and list so many charismatic animals from the african plains and then if i was like yeah but what lives in the acre around you right now most people are going to draw a blank or be able to name three things yeah. And if you take them outside, they look at the plant species around them like astronauts who've arrived on another planet who have yet to name the creatures that they're seeing. Uh huh. Uh huh. This right. is very strange because they know 500 Facebook friends and they know 75 brand logos uh -huh. and they know thousands of songs and commercial jingles and TV characters and movie stars, but they don't know the plants in their own lawn. And that means we're living like aliens on our own planet. And then we're sitting here being like, gee, I don't get it. Why are we destroying our own environment? It's like, well, yeah. it's kind of obvious because you yeah. don't have any stake in it. And if you don't start to develop a relationship in this generation, if we don't develop a relationship with the natural world, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We yeah, really I think are because so like Gen Z does not know the ecosystem. Yeah. I think it's one of those things too, where the more you get disconnected from the cycle of life, like you have this circle and the cycle of life that we're all participating in. And the more you disconnect yourself from that, I think the more sort of neurotic you get, or the more anxious you get, it's sort of like, you know, if you've been pent up inside and you want to just go out and hit a punching bag, or you want to go out for a hike or go lift some weights or go surfing or something, you just got all this pent up energy. And I think it's the same thing with the cycle of life, like we're disconnected from our birth, from our death, from how we harvest food and being involved in nature around us. And I think the more you live in this weird bubble that we all live in with cell phones and all that, I think you just get more neurotic or something. It's weird.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know? I, I often describe it as, well, I, I definitely know, and I feel, in some ways, I, I feel that maybe more dramatically than some people do because I have, I'm living with a foot in both of those worlds. Do you know what I mean? So I'll have days mm -hmm. where I have to do all of the like, the bookkeeping, taxes, pay the bills stuff. Yeah. On computers, on <laughs> cell phones, texting, I'm on Signal, I'm on my messenger, I'm on my email, like yeah. do all that. And then I have other days where I'm stalking turkeys in a ghillie suit on my belly and you know what I mean? Coming home with pockets <laughs> full of acorns. I have like both of those experiences. Yes. Oh, so wow. I can tell which one makes me feel good and which one hurts me. Yeah, totally. It's really, it's really easy because I, the contrast is so stark. And also I want to just build on what you said, because I agree about the neuroticism that it creates. And look, we're all pretty neurotic. Mm -hmm. I've, I've met enough people now to see that, you know, <laughs> see it in, in the mirror every day too. So yeah. um, I think another big part of it is that when I describe it like if you lived in a town your whole life, let's say you grew up in a small town and you, you know, or maybe you're in a city, but you have a community around you, you know, a whole bunch of people. So uh -huh. picture a place where you walk out when you walk out, it's like, cheers, everybody knows your name. It's like, it's like, Hey, how you doing? Oh, you know, all these people and you feel connected, you're integrated into a community. Right. Then think about moving to a brand new town or going to a new job or a new school or something like that. And you walk in and you don't know anyone. It's a very threatening an uncomfortable feeling when you're, you feel alone. So now extrapolate that out to the environment. When people go out into their own planetary environment, their, the mm -hmm. ecosystem around them. So I'm not saying we take somebody from New York city and we drop them off in, in, you know, Australia. I'm saying we take for somebody from New York city and we bring them to upstate New York. Yeah. <laughs> we put them outside right. and it's like a new town where they don't know anyone as far as the species go. So uh -huh. the trees don't know them. The forbs don't know them. The shrubs don't know them. The mammals, the amphibians, the insects and invertebrates don't know anybody. So it's kind of threatening mm -hmm. because you don't know anyone. You feel alone. So it, it's this sense of, well, if you look at every survival show, the premise, stay alive till you get back to the people. You know what I mean? It's never like, hey, I just want to go out and enjoy it. It's like, you're just trying to get back to civilization. That's the this popular show theme. That's how a lot of people feel when they go out there because, again, without knowing anyone, if you're never introduced to these species and not just introduced like, hey, you know, this is shad bush or whatever. Hey, this is a blueberry. Not just introduced, but actually in relationship reciprocally, particularly when you actually start to build your body by consuming the most intimate act on planet Earth. I take this living thing, put it in my mouth, chew it up, swallow it, and it becomes my cells. It's pretty intimate. And if you're not doing that with your environment, then your environment does not appear to be a source of sustenance to you. It becomes a threatening place full of potentially poisonous, itchy, mm -hmm. pokey, scratchy, bitey, eat you things. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very strong cognitive dissonance about saving the environment, but also feeling like the environment's a threatening place that you don't ever really want to be in because you don't understand it. So we've set up this really tough dichotomy here. Do you see what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. We say we want to save it, but then we always panic when we're in it and try to get back out of it. Or we're okay in it if we're on very well-defined trails with a map system and a GPS and a whole bunch of Gore-Tex and a big backpack full of supplies. And if I have all that stuff, then I'm safe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I have brought civilization on my back the way we bring civilization on our back when we go to space. It's the same thing we do. So we act like astronauts on our own planet. And I think that this paradigm needs to shift. Um, one of the beautiful things that's happening as we understand, as we get further and further on the transhuman pathway, mm. we start to see more and more that indigenous hunting and gathering peoples had something right that we are now missing. Mm -hmm. um, it was highlighted really well recently in David Attenborough's new documentary, A Life on Earth, because he sort of keeps contrasting that. And uh, I think that even if somebody just went in their backyard to harvest dandelion roots for some tea, you know, they don't have to go out and kill bears and, you know, <laughs> this kind of stuff. It's yeah. like having some relationship with the natural world uh, that it doesn't come through the mail, doesn't come through a store, but actually comes through a, a personal relationship. That's going to be a really crucial link because things are going to get weirder and more confusing as we move into the digital online era and and out of the era of people having a relationship with the planet i think like i said gen z it's like 
I'm Gen X. I remember before the internet. <clears throat> the millennials don't really remember before the internet. Mm -hmm. And Gen Z doesn't remember before social media. And so if we were to continue on this trajectory for much longer, there will be people who maybe have never experienced nature in any significant way. And those people will eventually be making major decisions about how we run the world. And that's kind of that we need to change that pretty fast. Definitely. <laughs> and I think that, um, people are becoming more and more, I, I think like what would be the right term weak, I guess, in a sense where, um, we're spending more time indoors. I remember one time you described it as like, if you were to remove all of the wood paneling in your walls and just remove all of your, of your walls of your house and just left the wiring in there, you're living in like this electrified cage, electronic cage. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just with all the dirty electricity and all that stuff. And it just, it really like, that's such a powerful just vision, you know, and we're spending almost all of our time indoors. I think it was something like 92% of the, our, our time we spend mm -hmm. indoors, which is, I mean, this is having a devastating effect on our upcoming Yeah, and now, now we're like generation. behind the mask, you know? So it's even like more so because yeah. now we're not even breathing fresh air. You know, you see people out, in, you know, in nature. I was recently in Agunquit, Maine, which is a really beautiful part of the state, beaches. And you, I was out on the beach and people had hundreds of yards. So I'm talking hundreds of, sometimes like a thousand feet to themselves on every side of the beach just the Atlantic ocean all the way to Europe. Right. And they are wearing a mask on the beach. Wow. It's like, <laughs> wow. I kind of thought that this was a place where you might want some fresh air. I don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's definitely safe. It's definitely safe. You could do it. Oh Free salty God. air here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like that metaphor, what you just brought up was I was saying, if you could just see the electricity in your walls, if, if you could take like a eye in the sky view of your life and you could see all the electricity, you'd see that you're living in kind of like an electric zoo. And when you go off the zoo, people don't like to be out there very long without coming back real quick. Now there's the adventurous of us who go camping, who go mountaineering, who go do kind of things out in nature. Mm -hmm. um, but typically it's all about getting back safe, back into the pen, you know? We, mm -hmm. uh, we are becoming, now here's the thing. It's, we, it's easy to say, look how weak we've become. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you could say that about, um, because we're domesticated, right? So right. you could be like, well, if we look at hunter gatherers who are not domesticated people, right? But the people who are actually living in wild places off of wild things, and that's how they make their, eke out their existence. Mm -hmm. be like that's the robust, undomesticated form of human, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we are the, of the house. That's what domestication means. So we're the domesticated form. That's true of dogs and wolves. So we could look at some of the dogs today and be like, look how weak these dogs are compared to wolves. But then we have to remember they are actually perfectly adapted to their environment, which is the house. So we are perfectly adapted to the indoors now, but we are weakly adapted to our natural environment. That's concerning to me, disconcerting to me because as we continue on that path, we become something that's no longer fit for our natural habitat. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem if we're going to have so many people, because if we are only adapted to the built environment, then we don't have, a, again, we get into this thing, save the environment, save the environment. It's like, yeah, but if you are maladapted to the environment and only adapted to the built environment, your incentive is to create more and more of the built environment and then to stay inside of it. So right. I think we're, we're at a neat crossroads because you can really rewild and readapt yourself to nature and it doesn't take a lot i'm not i'm not talking look at me like i don't i'm in my house i don't um i'm not <laughs> living i'm not living in like a hut made of skins you right, know right, around right. a fire like that's not how i live um what i do is take that time that we devote to leisure take that time that we devote to hobbies and i make my hobby readapting to the natural world and i do that through food but obviously there's a lot of ways to do that mm -hmm. um but i think that's something that people can participate in and i think um that this you know situation in 2020 has oh, that's been the ref the refuge for a lot of people here mm -hmm. in maine it's been amazing because you know a lot of states shut down people's access to the outdoors and maine really encouraged people to get outdoors particularly our department of inland fish and wildlife really promoted hunting fishing things like that in the outdoors. And so here in this state, we've been spending more time outside than usual. Mm -hmm. And that's been really beautiful to see. So I, one of the things that's been highlighted for me is that if you have 
chosen to live in the urban environment, boy, it might be indoors more than ever. And if you've chosen to live in a rural environment, you might have more opportunity than ever to be outside. Uh, so that's like one of the things that I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Uh, your website for those that are interested is wild fed, uh, W I -L -D. wild dash fed. Yeah. 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 Dash fed. Um, when we come back, I'm taking a little break right now. Um, but when we come back, I want to ask you, like, I'm curious, like what your overall goal is for the podcast and the TV show that you're doing? Like, is it like, what would be the over, if you could just snap your fingers, what would be the overall sort of goal, um, with what you're doing. Um, super, super fascinating guys. Make sure to check out Daniel's website. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Um, I want to take a little break right now and bring up one of our favorite products that we just love. And this is our relax far infrared sauna. And this thing is something that I use probably I'd say about three days a week. Um, just an incredible piece of equipment. And let me bring this up so you guys can take a look at it. And this is a great way to detoxify your system um, from heavy metals, from toxins, from chemicals, all of these things, these en environmental poisons that get stored in our fat cells. Um, we have to be able to figure out a way to get these to be released from our system so it's not putting a constant burden on our immune system. And here's a couple of cool little uh, snippets from some of our previous guests. Uh, here's Dr. Christopher Shea talking about the importance of detoxification. How do I detoxify from plastics? I mean, you guys are using a sauna and uh, that's something I'd like to get. And what does a sauna do for us? Uh, a sauna is great, but it's moving a number of different toxins. Remember, we talked about the mice that if you put PCBs in there, then that made the mercury all that much worse. And Sweating moves out a lot of plastics, volatiles, fat-based toxins. It's really good at moving those out and sweating those out. So that's how you're getting those out, and those are contributing to this synergistic soup inside the body. And so that's why they're good is they're taking out a, a bunch of the different things in the soup. Yeah, guys, we have so many things that are putting such a burden on our immune system from heavy metals, toxins, poisons, environmental, um, you know, toxins and things going on, you know, in our environment that get stored in our body and they place this percentage burden on your immune system. And here's um, another clip of our, our favorite biological dentist. If you guys are looking for a biological dentist, Dr. Stuart Nunley, I'm telling you guys, we just got back. We drove uh, from California to Texas with our two-year-old twin boys uh, for the second time with twins. We've seen him multiple times, but um, this is how much we value his work. And he's at healthysmilesforlife.com, Dr. Stuart Nunley. And he was, um, I think he was diagnosed with something crazy like Lou Gehrig's disease, disease because at, at one point he was, before he realized what he was doing with mercury fillings, he was removing them uh, unsafely. And um, this is his little story of how he detoxified from all that. Uh, you know what <laughs> I chose to do? I chose to go very, very, Slow as I detox. So one of the things that I did is I invested in an infrared sauna, okay. which was huge. That was a big, big part of my healing because interestingly enough, many times patients who have heavy metal toxicity lose the ability to sweat. And so I, and I was one of those, I could not break a sweat. And the infrared sauna helped me to retrain my body to be able to sweat. It was a huge part of my overall detox. Doesn't Hal Huggins, Dr. Huggins say, as long as there's more going out than what's coming in, you're okay? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I think he's right. I think yeah. he's uh, absolutely right on that. Yeah, so we have these toxins. I think there's about 60,000 chemicals that are um, introduced into our environment since the early or late 1960s. There's reading somewhere recently about 84,000 chemicals uh, in commerce at any given time. I mean, and that's not counting the chemicals that are in our food, in the air, in the water. Uh, I was reading about, I think, over 20,000 chemicals in certain uh, certain um, water districts around the, the nation. I mean, it's, like these things just get stored in our body. And so it's a great way to uh, detoxify is through this relaxed far infrared sauna. We sell multiple types of saunas, like the wooden ones, and we sell uh, an ozone sauna. So if you guys are interested in those, we have the Therasage sauna as well. Therasage, I think it's called. Um, but this is the one that we use and recommend, um, but we sell multiple versions of them on biochargeme.com. So um, consider starting to make regular detoxification through sweat um, a part of your life and bring these things and these tools into your home so that you can detoxify. And one of the things we're talking about with Daniel uh, just a minute ago was um, this dirty electricity and uh, dirty electricity in your walls. We've had Magda Havis on the show talking about how dirty electricity in these magnetic and electric fields that come off of these wires um, in your walls, they'll actually affect your blood sugar. And Martin Paul was on our show, gosh, what was it? A couple, 
couple months ago, and he was talking about the cell membrane and the voltage-gated calcium ion channels of the the, uh, the cell membrane. And what this does is it actually causes calcium to flood the inside of your cells, I think around to about a thousand times what they should be. So this is causing tons and tons of issues. And he's, I think, mapped out over a hundred different conditions to just this dirty electricity in the walls and its effect on your cell membrane. And here's uh, our buddy, Ken Rolla talking about how to mitigate that. Dirty electricity, what that does and what it is actually for people that aren't aware is when, you know, when the power company is generating electricity and sending it to you, they don't have a constantly perfect steady supply of 120 volt, 60 Hertz electricity pulsing to you perfectly every time. It fluctuates quite a bit. And if you put meters on it, you can see it'll fluctuate. And so that fluctuation, and there are micro fluctuations as well. And those micro fluctuations, all that fluctuation creates these pulses in the wiring that will create EMF pulses around you. I mean, the wires themselves, when electricity is flowing through them, that will create a field around the wires that can affect you. But then when you've got all that little pulsing and micro pulsing going on, it's creating these frequencies of fields that are pulsing and affecting you negatively. And so those devices like the green wave, they will act like an inductor and smooth that signal out so you don't get all that all those that pulsing. And then my devices, because of the skater fields, they will structure the EMF coming off of the wires in your house and everything mm -hmm. else uh, mm -hmm. as well. I use those uh, I use Stetzer filters and Green Wave. I got both. Yeah. So like one of the sort of works or messages, I should say, of Daniel Vitalis is like this idea of rewilding. And, and that was the name of his podcast for years. And this is this idea of, of trying to bring nature back into our daily existence. But like he was just saying on the show, it's like we live to some degree in two worlds, right? We, we try to do our best, but we live indoors a lot of times. And so what are we doing to mitigate this? And the green wave filter, I recommend these for your for your bedroom, for places where you spend lots of time, uh, baby's room, maybe an office if you work in a home office, like I've got them in my walls here. And um, this will help greatly reduce the amount, I think o like over 90% of the amount of dirty electricity coming off the walls. So super, super important. These things are like 30 bucks, you know, and you can get multiple ones and put them in, you know, different areas of your house. And so I, I would highly recommend getting some of these to help mitigate your environment, especially when you're indoors, obviously. Um, and so that you can really limit the amount of electrical and magnetic pulses coming off these, um, these wires in your walls. Crazy, right? It's so crazy how our walls, like Brian Hoyer came to our house, an EMF expert, and he came to our house and he had like $30,000 worth of equipment and he was measuring our walls. And before we got these meters and it's like, Oh my gosh, the amount of magnetic and electric energy coming off of our walls was just insane. Um, so I highly recommend these mitigation strategies where you can, um, you know, fix and alter your environment to uh, better support your biology. So we're going to come back right with Daniel Vitalis right after this. You're listening to Extreme Health Radio, and I hope you're enjoying this show. Please share it with your friends by tagging at Extreme Health Radio on Instagram. Stay tuned for new shows weekly. Yeah, it's funny. I was telling Daniel before the show that um, I think we got about like eight more emails from <laughs> from YouTube uh, censoring even more of our videos. And, um, you know, it's it's coming up to, ch to challenging times. You know, you're seeing entire platforms being taken off offline. And so um, the way around that is to share people's content. If you like people's podcasts, if you like the work they're doing, if you like the work that Daniel Vitalis is doing or any other podcast you listen to, it doesn't have to be ours. But I think the way we, we subvert this is we start sharing our um, information because uh, they can't stop everything from happening. And so they can take accounts down, but the more people that share good, empowering information, the better. Um, so all that to say, follow us on Instagram if you, uh, for as long as they'll have us, I'm not sure how long they'll have us, but um, until we say something we're not supposed to say, but uh, <laughs> make sure to follow us. Follow Daniel as well on Wild Fed. Um, I think it's uh, wild.fed. I think that's your handle, right, Daniel? Yeah, on Instagram, it's wild.fed. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I was going to, you know, I wanted to ask you before the show, like what is your ultimate goal with the the TV show, the podcast and all the materials you're, you're producing? What's the overall goal? Like what would you, if you could snap your finger and have, have it completely happen the way you want, what would be the result? Well, the mission statement is reconnecting people with wild nature through food. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so food is the Trojan horse of, of how we're connecting people with nature. I think the food piece is really important. As you know, I spent more than a decade publicly teaching about food and mm-hmm. kind of uh, it's very near and dear to me. So the food piece is important to me, but I think even more important is the connection with nature. And so I'm using food uh, to do that. Uh-huh. Um, with the TV show, you know, I'm trying to do, I got three goals for the show. I want it to be art. I want it to be entertainment and I want it to be education. So the goal is all three of those things. And the idea is to inspire people to develop their own relationship with the place where they live. Okay. Cause I love this idea of people being made out of the place where they live, even if it's only in part. Uh-huh. So there's this really strange phenomenon that you look out in the world and you see all these human beings who are made out of different places, but not the place where they are. Right. My, what I'm talking about is you're made out of food and uh-huh. water. And <laughs> right. where's that food and water coming from? Usually it's not from the place where people are. I mean, people get all excited if they find a piece of steak that came from within a hundred miles. What is the benefit of that though? What, what is the benefit of eating? Like if you are, are going to eat a steak, what is the benefit of eating a steak that's local to you versus not? Yeah, well, I think there's quite a few things going on and well, and I'll explain why I am excited about being made of place. But I think the biggest piece is that all of that shipping and logistics, it's interesting. It's exactly what you talked about before. I mean, when we hit a crisis point, people had to dump out the milk and kill all the hogs because they didn't have, there wasn't a shortage of food. There was a shortage of distribution because we have these very cumbersome and complex distribution networks. Mm -hmm. And if we had been relying on more local food, that wouldn't have been an issue. Obviously all the trucking and the shipping and the emissions and all of those kind of things that get food to all the places they need to be. But ultimately, I just think it makes sense to be made out of the place that's underneath your feet. Because if you don't, you don't have a stake in the place. You're not a stakeholder in your own environment. Yeah. And what something... makes me a stakeholder in my own watershed is that I drink the water from here and I eat the food that, that lives here. I say lives here because people forget that food is the body parts of living creatures. Uh-huh. Right. So if you're going to be made out of living creatures and vegans, you're not exempt. You're, you're made out of living plant creatures and fungal creatures and bacterial creatures. And mm-hmm. those of us who also eat animals are made out of additionally animals, all these living things. That's what our food is. Does it make sense to be made out of food from all these other places where you aren't? Or does it make more sense to be made out? Now I'm not saying like, don't enjoy things that come from other places. But I'm saying that shouldn't be what we rely on exclusively. So a big part for me is connecting people back to their landscape. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I'm really doing with the show, both the podcast um, and the the TV show, is curating stories about food so that it's there like an anthology so people can go back. I mean, some of these things are slipping away really quickly. Mm-hmm. So part of it is to curate that. Um, another big part, Justin, that a lot of people don't realize, this is really interesting. <laughs> So we have in the United States, all of this biological research, right? We have people who study deer, people who study moose, people who study bear and raccoons and squirrels and every kind of creature. Right. You know where the money comes from for that? Jeez, no. Most people don't, right? Yeah. So if you ask people, hey, what's paying for all these, these field biologists who give us all this research, uh-huh. that money comes almost exclusively from hunters hunting licenses oh, and the purchase okay. and sale of hunting equipment. Now, another really interesting thing is it comes from the purchase of firearms. Firearms are also part of this. So let's say that you are somebody who doesn't hunt, but you collect, you, you, you go buy a handgun. Let's uh-huh. say COVID hit. You're like, I'm buying a handgun. You go buy <laughs> like a Glock 19. It has nothing to do with hunting. Right. 11% of that cost goes into a federal fund that's distributed to the States for the study of wildlife called the Pittman Robinson Act. Really? Okay. Um, whenever you buy hunting equipment uh-huh. or a hunter a hunting license, that money goes into state and federal um, collection baskets that's then distributed out for biology. So what's interesting is you'll have like the vegans, for instance, save the environment, save the environment, stop those hunters, get right. rid of the firearms. It's like, yeah. okay, uh, can I hear your alternative plan? Because if we did that tomorrow, we would have no funding for wildlife. Now I'm not saying there's not other ways it could be done, but that's how it's done. So Uh what's happening, part of what's going on is that as we have less and less hunter engagement, uh, we have less and less funds available 
for the states to continue to do the research that allows us to understand what's even happening on our landscape. So that's also really important. So there's a lot of different prongs to like why yeah. I'm doing this. Yeah, it's really, really interesting I because wonder, how much have you heard the debate about firearms, firearms ownership? And then oh, when have huge. you ever heard anybody say, when have anyone ever given you enough nuance to say, oh, by the way, if we do ban firearms, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for wildlife because currently 11% of all firearms and ammunition sales, 11% goes to a federal fund that's distributed to the states to use exclusively on wildlife management. That's amazing. I mean, Not much. That's right? amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible yeah. because I'll tell you who's not been putting up money for this. You know what I mean? Well, I don't even have to tell you. Yeah. But a lot of the people who would like to stop this stuff are not contributing. And uh, not that's not to say they wouldn't, there aren't ways we could get them to contribute maybe, but they're not contributing the way that that hunters are. So this is really important from a conservation perspective that people like one of the th best things people can do if they want to support conservation is go buy a hunting license, even if you're not going to hunt mm -hmm. or go to the post office in order to hunt waterfowl, for instance. And by the way, if you've never eaten wild duck, I mean, it's or wild geese. I mean, they're just <laughs> incredible. Wow. Um, but in order to hunt uh, waterfowl because waterfowl migrate, right? They're migratory birds, which means they're moving through these flyways across multiple states. Um, okay. you know, we're at a time of the year now where they're headed from the North, where they've spent the summer and they're headed South. Right. So they cross multiple States. So the States don't regulate waterfowl on their own, but they regulate it in conjunction with the federal government. Okay. So in order to hunt waterfowl, I have to <clears throat> both buy my state's hunting license, but also have to go to the post office and buy a $25 stamp, uh -huh. a duck stamp every year. Without that, I can't hunt waterfowl. Now that $25 all goes to, um, the protection and, um, building up of wetland habitat. So you can go to the post office and buy a $25 duck stamp. You don't have to hunt and you get to contribute to there being more habitat for waterfowl. This is how we have the greatest game management system that's ever existed in the world is since people hunted and gathered. There's never been a place like North America. Our model is incredible. I mean, you can go to many other places in the world and you'll find out very quickly that there is either not wildlife left in significant amounts for people to hunt and gather, uh, or they don't have access to them. For instance, consider the European model. In England, for instance, if you own land, you own the game on your land. Mm -hmm. This is not how it works here in the United States. Are you familiar with the North American model? Do you know how this works? No, Just no, no. Okay, so wh what state are you in right now? California. Okay. So Cal in California, if there's a, a let's say there's a, a deer on your property, mm -hmm. you own access to that deer because you own the property. So you could tell somebody they can't come on that property, but every Californian owns that deer together in a trust, a wildlife trust. So oh. it sounds kind of weird at first when you hear it, but, but all of the animals are owned by the people of the state. Okay. And you all have equal access. Now, when you buy a hunting license, what you get is a tag. That tag allows you to take an animal out of it like a bank account. You get to go make a withdrawal of that animal. So if I here in Maine shoot a bear and I'm going to bring that, I put my tag on the bear, that bear now goes from being the property of all the people of that state to being my property so okay. that I can bring it home. But we own the animal in trust. This system has kept the animal numbers very high in the United States, such that we can have hunting in every state. You go to other countries and they just, many of them do not have this because they don't have a model like ours, but that model is funded by people who hunt, people who fish, people who purchase firearms. That's just how it works currently. And so, you know, there's just a lot, like people are very unaware of what's going on outside. We're so, we're so aware of the Kardashians, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're so right. aware of like, of all of these, um, social stories, but we are so alienated from our own ecosystem and we're alienated from how that ecosystem's managed. So what's cool about when you, you know, hunt fish and forage is that you start to become a participant, but particularly with hunting and fishing, because they require mm -hmm. these licenses, you start to learn a little bit about how this works. And one of the things you come across really quickly is that there's all of these biologists and wardens who are out there doing this work and the people don't know about it. And the people are all screaming about the environment. 
Mm-hmm. You see, there's this huge disconnect because yeah. they're not aware of how this environment is actually being maintained and or managed. So um, rather than, you know, just talking about it or buying an electric car, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I find really funny. I just find hilarious because you're, you're the, how is this better? Right. I really don't understand how this is better. Um, you have a vehicle that's made out of the exact same stuff. So the rubber of the tires, the metal alloys of the wheels, the metal of the body, all the plastics inside. It's the same. Yeah, Yeah, the paint. It's exactly the same thing. Now you don't have the direct emissions that you're used to because that emissions are where the electricity is being produced, Mm -hmm. right? So that electricity doesn't just magically show up. (laughs) It's a dam somewhere keeping salmon from being able to move upriver. It's Uh a nuclear power plant that we'll have to maintain the core of for 6 million years or whatever that is. It's... Uh um, garbage being burned it's coal being burned but you get that feeling of like see how much i care yeah it's like i'm not saying that we shouldn't move towards electric cars because that's probably a a good direction i I don't i'm not an expert on that but i do see that it's like all you're we're really doing is moving the pollution over to where we don't see it anymore so our community feels very clean yeah but actually somewhere else we're generating all that Right. So So this stuff that we, the ways that people think they're, it's like, yeah, but I I cut my six pack rings up every time before I put them in the garbage. It's like, (laughs) okay, why don't you come out with me on the landscape and we'll actually see what nature really is about. And you can assess for yourself the situation nature's in. Um, But, you know, it's very hard to tell from, from home in Mm -hmm. front of our computers. Now, how much, um, how much, or how, how often do you hunt? For your food and, and what percentage of your food would you say is is from your environment is it most of it yeah all my meats all my meats i mean well if i go out to a restaurant or i go to visit somebody i yeah. eat it, they feed me but right right but my i just reorganized my freezers yesterday which i have to do several times a year it's quite it's yeah. a big job <laughs> you know like those chest <laughs> freezers it get, they're very hard to keep organized i've tried a lot yeah. of different methods and it's hard um so yesterday i pulled those apart and so you know there was bear, there was deer, there was turkey. Um, there's many species of fish. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all the dog food. I mean, I just made 42 kilos of dog food from wild game. Um, you know, there's all those, these different meats, they fill three freezers and that's what we eat at home. So we, we don't ever bring maybe twice a year. I'll get some bacon cause it's something I can't harvest my, yeah. on my own. We don't have wild hogs here. Uh, mm-hmm. other than that, yeah, it's hundred percent of our meats. And then lots of plants cycle through. I don't have yet, you know, that one of the biggest challenges is that hunting and gathering peoples traditionally have been in groups of 30 to 50 on huge open tracts of land. Uh So now I'm doing all this in everything's private property and it's fragmented ecosystems. It's just me or me and my wife. It's very difficult to do as an individual. This right. is something that people used to do as a tribe. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can it's, you can only make it so far and still like have a job and a company mm-hmm. and all those kind of things, you know. Yeah, and still work. But yeah. um, and still do it. But but I would say we eat a, a wild meats every single day, and then uh, often multiple times a day, and we eat wild plants multiple times through the week, or multiple uh-huh. or mushrooms as well. Um, so constantly it's coming up. I'm using it all the time. You know, I cook in bear fat all the time. I, um, and the process right now of finishing up some acorn flour, which I'll be using to sort of bread my squirrels that I'll be cooking later today, uh-huh. nice. um, you know, so it's a lot and, uh, and medicines as well, of course, herbal medicines too. So, uh, it's a significant amount of our food, but it, it's not nearly as much as I would like it to be. I'd like to get better at this, be able to do more, have more people that I'm working with <clears throat> in order to do it. Um, but like I said, you know, we're, this is the Anthropocene age. Uh, mm-hmm. the age of, you know, pollution you were talking before, I mean, uh, on your ad there about PCBs and heavy metals, it's like, mm-hmm. it's not just humans, right? We have it pretty bad, but so do animals. Mm-hmm. And so it's in addition to the fact that, um, it's difficult already to, you know, how much you can do of this. You also have to be thoughtful about where you hunt and fish. It's not like, um, I can't go down and throw a line in a fish in the super fun site. You know, mm-hmm. I have to think about where I'm going to take animals from and what have they been eating and what have they been exposed to, um, which is good, which is good because mm-hmm. you want to confront that again. Like if, when all our food just comes prepackaged from the store or pre-processed for us, um, that stuff's all very removed. We don't have to think about it. But when you're like, Hey man, I hunt here 
and you're polluting right here. I want to protect that place viscerally mm -hmm. in a way that I wouldn't even necessarily care about. Because you, have you seen this thing over the last couple of years? We'll have like a big story come up uh, and they'll be important. It'll be about a pipeline, let's say, or it'll be about a dam project. And the whole country will get up in arms about this place. And you'll have people who are spending all day on the internet or flying over there to yeah. protest. And it's like, that's important. But like, what about your backyard, man? There's a lot going on where you live that you don't know about. You're not maybe even, can, you, social media gets us wrapped up in something that's happening distant to us, but we often are not paying attention to what's happening at home because we're mm -hmm. not out there. Okay, anyway, back to your question. How mm -hmm. much do I hunt and forage and whatnot? Um, uh, there's always something in season to be doing particularly with plants right up until there's frost. So every week I'm out multiple times usually. Uh -huh. And, um, but the bigger thing, Justin is processing. So we talk about, we throw around the word processed food, right? We just, we, we say processed about things as a way of saying that it's bad food, mm -hmm. but we don't understand typically because it's like I said before with Gen Z doesn't know a world without social media. Millennials don't know a world without internet. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't remember a world before processed food. So when we talk about it, we talk about it. it to us, it's like, um, it just means like that it's bad. It came from a factory. Yeah. Okay, here's the reality. Let's say I go harvest wild rice in the fall. Now, wild rice is not just come off the plant as little grains of rice that I can eat. Yeah, yeah. yeah Believe yeah, me, totally. it's, it's yeah. a lot more work than that. <laughs> so I got to bring all of this rice home in the canoe. I got to okay. lay it out on tarps to dry. Once it's dried, I got to take that and put it in a big pan and parch it over a fire, over heat to dry out the chaff. Then okay. I got to winnow it in a pair of leather moccasins and I use my feet to break apart all of the chaff and then I have to winnow it to get all of that off and then I'm left with rice. Now, people take for granted the fact that you can go buy processed rice. This was a major, this is what one of the things that led to all of the leisure time that human beings have now to yeah. write books and do art and post stuff on social media. Where are we getting all of this free time? We spent most of our time processing food in the past. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing of when there first started to be processed food, that's why it was such a big deal and it was so exciting to people. And it was like a symbol of wealth, mm -hmm. of success that you weren't having to do this processing work anymore. Right. You dig? Right. So this is a big this is a big advent so a lot of my time going out and hunting a deer is fun and um engaging and exciting and i get to interact with these places and these animals mm -hmm. but up until i pull the trigger there's not really been much work as soon as that animal's on the ground now i've got work to do i oh, gotta wow. get over there and gut that animal i gotta get that animal back home i gotta get that animal out of its hide i gotta break down all the parts i gotta age that animal then i have to fully butcher it down and get it into packages and then get it into my freezer mm -hmm. i gotta grind stuff i gotta make stock out of this part i got it's a lot of oh, it's work. a lot of work yeah and um, then once you get right. it all then you have to figure out a way to cook it all how you're going to cook it what you're going to make with it i mean that's a whole separate process after that part's, you've already that part's processed. Fun. I like yeah. That part. uh <laughs> yeah but it is it's a there's a lot to it so Every day in the field is represented by multiple days of work, usually at yeah. home, to get that done. It's like we went and harvested cranberries the other day. And those cranberries, are, are they are pretty easy to use, except that every cranberry has just this littlest stem on there. Uh, so my yeah. wife's got to go through each one and just break that stem off. Otherwise, those are going to all end up in the cranberry sauce. That we make, yeah. right? So it's like those little things. They can take they they're time consuming, and you figure out how to do them in a way that's fun and engaging and whatnot. But um, but there's a lot of work to it. And for me, you know, we've known each other a long time, so you kind of know where I was at before. I was more in the you know I had rewild yourself as a podcast. I was promoting a lot of these ideas, but not necessarily doing this kind of work that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I'm doing now is my chop wood carry water thing. It's like, I got to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And I kind of got to a place where I was like, man, everybody's out here. We're all talking about mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. but like, what's the actual, where's the actual investment and in work? And so I decided to do this because I, I was feeling like it was a little empty. Mm -hmm. It's like, I wanted to see what is a natural person's life actually like, what, how much work is there and what is, how gratifying is that work? Because mm -hmm. I just go to the whole foods. And just get my stuff. I it's know, like, right? It's all ready to go. I bring it home. It's ready to cook. It's like yeah. I wanted more than that. And um, now I have a much richer appreciation 
Um, but I also know what food is. And, and a lot of us, I didn't really know what food was before. Mm-hmm. And um, man, it's funny. It's like you, it's, there are certain things it's like an apple. If I go pick an apple off the tree, it's like ready to eat, but there's not a lot of things that are like that. No, you know, when I, I harvest know. acorns, yeah, ac- acorns, I have to dry, crack, pick, grind to flour, and then leach in changes of water for 10 days. Wow. And it's really interesting when you do that, you see what it takes to turn an acorn into food. So it, it also gives you an appreciation when you sit down at a restaurant or somebody cooks for you and you know what it actually took for that food to become what it is on your plate. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, there's a deep appreciation. So much, yeah. When I see, when I see how much rice comes out, if you go to like, um, a Thai place or you go to like a, an Asian inspired restaurant and they give you these huge servings of rice, sushi, something like that. Uh huh. You're like, man a grain what the value of a grain of rice to me now having wow. uh, processed rice it's wow. like you'll see where it's like they bring you so much that you're like i'm only going to eat a quarter of this and the rest of it's it can't be eaten you know it's too much for it's a amazing. person to eat and it's just this crazy abundance and it connects you to the idea of why there's seven billion plus people because mm-hmm. people are made out of food and so there has to be outrageous excess of food for there to be such an outrageously huge population. For the population to continue growing, it means we have way too much food because the population is held in check by the amount of food that it has. Mm-hmm. So if we, if we, it's like, there's, we will never get the population down by overeating. Right. right. People make babies, you know, yeah. and they feed them food and <laughs> totally. food's what they're made out of. Right. So yeah. anyway, it gives you a pretty big appreciation for all that stuff. Gosh, it's so fascinating, man. I could talk with you for hours. I'd love to just talk with you about like your your hunts and and, and how you get the food out and all that. But I know you're we're right up at an, at an hour right now, and I know you're um got some some friends coming over. But I wanted to, I'm going to bring up your website, and I want you to just tell people like your podcast, your your show. How can people interact? I want to know more about the show and and where people can find it. So let me bring this up while you're talking. I'll show your website here so people can take a look here. Okay. So yeah, Uh, the website is wild-fed.com. And if you go there, you can get access obviously to the podcast and all of that and our little store and such, um, and our social media. Uh, I'm most active on Instagram, two places, Daniel Vitalis at Daniel Vitalis is my Instagram, my personal one. And then wild.fed is, uh, I post there several times a week as well. And then the podcast is, man, I mean, what a dream. I love doing the podcast. I get to talk about all the subjects that are interesting to me. So um, a lot of it's wow. about food. A lot of it is uh, I'll, I'll be talking with biologists about specific animals or specific plants or algae, seaweeds, like whatever I get interested in, I get to talk to people about it. And so if you're um, interested in starting to understand nature from a hunter-gatherer perspective and not just from the environmentalist perspective, but as an interactive citizen ecologist, then the Uh podcast would be great for you. And then the show, Wild Fed, the TV show. uh, Oh no, don't show them that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Those are bears that I harvested the last, the last two years, actually. Uh, Wow. That's Um, amazing. I've been, I've been, I've been eating those bears for the last uh, two years. How many, how many Um, pounds of meat can you get from a bear like this size? Well, you don't run into bears that size very often. Um, yeah. but when you do, you're talking about hundreds of pounds of meat wow. and fat. That's the other thing. So that is the equivalent for us as wild food gatherers. That's like a pig on our landscape. We make lard so from cool. bear. So yeah. I have just gallons of bear fat, which is one of the most, you see all that fat right there? Yeah. Look at all that. that renders down like lard. It's incredible. That's wow. what an amazing, and it's most compositionally. Here's what's neat about it, Justin. Compositionally, it's closest to olive oil, not lard. Lard's really? a saturated fat, but but bears are like uh, that's the that's the fat there cubed up before I um, process it. Oh, wow. uh, that that is um, an oleic acid. It's a monounsaturated fat, so it's a lot like wow. olive oil. Fantastic cooking oil. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. Wow. So if you go to if you go to uh, wild-fed.com, so cool. you'll find everything, and then our show will be on cable. I can't announce everything yet, but we'll be on cap- cable uh, early 2021. Yeah, because I know you you did some sort of launch, right? When it first came out, is it we did. still? We put the show still... we put the show out online. Well, it, we've just taken it down. So what happened is uh, we put the show out in January of uh, 2020, and uh, we were we put out the first episode free, and then we sold the rest of the season, which was eight episodes. But really quickly, um, we got picked up and um, got this great opportunity to bring That's it to awesome. a much bigger audience. And so we're taking uh, that opportunity, and so we've had to take it down 
from the web, obviously, um, because we're licensing it to a cable network. So, yeah. uh, yeah. So right now you can't see wild fed the show. You can see some of the trailers and stuff on my, uh, Instagram page, okay. uh, beautiful show. I'm really proud of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there'll be 10, 22 minute episodes, um, hitting in, uh, in the beginning of the year. So this was, you've and done they, season some one. cool stuff, man. Season yeah, one is really up. cool. I mean, you, you see, um, lots of foraging and lots of hunting in, in new England, but also we travel a bit too. So, um, so you see bear, deer, turkey, fiddleheads, leeks, wild rice, cranberries, but we also go to do some exotic stuff like go to Florida and I harvest iguanas there. Um, there's a huge invasive green iguana issue in the wow. keys. So I go there and I snare iguanas and I turn them into tacos and they're incredible. Dude, we eat every episode. So so you cool. see the meals. Yeah. They're awesome, man. The chicken of the trees, wow. you know, fantastic. Yep. Um, what else? Uh, you know, we, I don't want to give away too much, but, uh, yeah. you'll see some animals that you're very familiar with, like pigeons, okay. for instance, mm -hmm. which are the original human poultry. So when you're in this urban environment and you see pigeons, like they're, that's not a wild animal. That's a escaped domesticated animal. That's one of the, that's the first domesticated bird and it lives everywhere we live. And wow. it used to be this great thing. Cause wherever you go, you could always have, you could always count on a pigeon for dinner. And uh, wow. now people think, oh, they're rats with wings. It's like, oh, really? Because yeah. it's like the it's steak inside there. It's not chicken inside of underneath all those beautiful that plumage. What's underneath yeah. there is steak, red meat steak. It's amazing. Uh, so yeah, anyway, all, there's a lot of really cool species that show up. Uh, a lot of incredible plant foods, some mushroom species as well. And you'll see us in everything from spring and summer right up and through the winter when we're fishing through the hard water on the ice, mm -hmm. um, catching salmon. You know, do we know yeah. like um like where on cable are you allowed to say that or is i'm it not like, gonna say yet i can't, can't say, say it right? but we'll be announcing all that really soon yeah, yeah. okay cool so probably the best thing to do would be get on your email list or follow your instagram or something yeah. to get those announcements yeah if you if you we put out a newsletter every two weeks called the subsistence okay and uh the, that's where i i get to write blogs or we have guest blogs um we put out all of the interviews that i've been a part of we put out little video vignettes and things like that. It's a really nice newsletter. Actually, I take a lot of pride in what we do there. I know it's tough because I know there's so many newsletters and everybody, you get signed up without even asking half the time, but we really put a lot of energy in and we, we do it every two weeks. So it come mm -hmm. out on Tuesdays um, and it's a beautiful newsletter and all, you know, we announce all our stuff there. So. Dude, that's awesome. Dude, thanks so much for your time. Like, it's been so cool knowing yeah, you and man. seeing the evolution of your journey. Cause I, like Thank I said, you. I was, I was you. following you from the raw vegan days and all that stuff. Right. So it's so cool to see. Yeah, it would be fun to talk more about that journey sometime because obviously, as you know, I mean, I'm, I empathize with where people are at in the diet wars because I come from that and yeah. where I'm at now, it's so nice to finally be like at a place where now I don't care what anyone says about food anymore. It's yeah. like, come out and show, <laughs> come out and show me because yeah. I'll show you, you know, I mean, you know, I don't say that braggy. It's just like when you're out there, people's ideas philosophically about what humans are supposed to eat start feeling really silly. Yeah, you go totally. out in the na into nature itself and you, you're like, Hey man, look, there's no tofu and good luck being a carnivore or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, you eat what you, you eat a mix of things, you know? Man. But anyway, I appreciate you being along on the journey with me all yeah, this time. Man. And, uh, thank you for putting me on your platform today. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, I re really appreciate all the work you do. Like I said, and it's wild fed, wild dash fed.com. And, um, dude, let's, uh, let's do another show sometime. Um, you know, maybe Love when the to. new um season comes out maybe we could talk about it yeah that'd be great that'd be that'd great be awesome i'll give you a little more time next time awesome all right dude thanks so much have a great time uh, tonight with your friends and stuff and filming thank you so much take care all right man have a good one bye all right there you go guys daniel vitalis interesting interesting guy right love uh, the work that he does i've got a few things i want to share with you because like i mentioned in the show it's interesting that like sometimes you get one or two aspects of um, of something. You know, you read a book, you might just remember one or two lines or just one concept of the book. And uh, I wanna share with you some some things. And also um, a sale he's running. We didn't get a chance to talk to him about the sale that he's running. So let me run a little break right now. And then when I come back, I'll share with you uh, the sale that he's got going on at Sir Thrival. And if you go through our link, um, it'll help support the show that we do. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that show. That was episode six, seven, for extremehealthradio.com slash 674. And um, I'm going to show this right now because I think this is just a wonderful, wonderful food that I think if you guys are considering something to help support your gut and your digestion, 
Um, it is aloe vera. Check this out. And then I encourage, you know, we can talk more about this. How, what do I do to help people speed up the healing of leaky gut? Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned aloe before, mm -hmm. and that is one of the herbs that I definitely recommend, you know, using for helping to heal leaky gut. You want to use herbs that are anti-inflammatory and soothing and healing to the intestinal lining. Um, so aloe is a great one. Yeah, it's interesting too because you think about this idea that um, you know aloe can be so healing, and there's certain herbs that help heal the gut, like L-glutamine, um, colostrum, which is something that I'm a big fan of. We'll talk to you about that, which is Daniel Vitalis's product over at Sir Thrival, um, bone broth, and aloe vera. And I think that um, aloe is should be at the top of your list. The the, the founder of Stockton Aloe One. Uh, was Rodney Stockton. I think he was like 96 years old when he died. And he, he said that uh, the reason why he lived so long was the ingestion of and the regular consumption of aloe vera for most of his life. Um, this stuff is incredible. It comes to you flash frozen. Um, so they harvest it, they pick it, and then they um, blend it. And that's all it is. If you go to the health food store, you're, you're going to see all kinds of tagalongs. But this stuff is amazing. It's got over 75 different compounds, vitamins, minerals, enzymes, amino acids, um, polysaccharides. Um, it helps to to accelerate wound healing inside and outside of the body. Um, it topically helps prevent aging. It's antibacterial, it's antifungal, it's antiviral, um, and it's anti tumor as well. I can't say it cures anything, but it's one of the best things. They say it. It, it has a substance called ace manin in it to um apparently it in, induces macrophages to produce interferon and tumor necrosis factor a which makes it an incredible product for not just digestion um, but anti-aging as well um really soothing you can add it to your smoothies you can just do a shot glass an ounce or two a day and i, I highly recommend um, getting on some some aloe vera gel and this is really great. So um, make sure to check that out. And then also, while you're drinking the aloe vera, you can jump up and down on a Bellicon rebounder. I wanted to mention about <laughs> rebounders just for a minute. Uh, there's been some studies that rebounders bring down the eye pressure and glaucoma. And it's something that I recommend for people who've been diagnosed with glaucoma. And I've done a lot of videos on the connection between the lymph system and eye health. So I'm right there with you. I think uh, the rebounder is a great activity for improving uh, eye length and overall lymph health. Mm -hmm. I think so too, because what people talk about it and, you know, it being a cellular exercise, you know, you go to the gym and you can't work out like, you know, cells in your body or different areas of your body, like your nose and your eyes and things like that. But uh, jumping up and down is, it affects every cell in your body, doesn't it? It, does. it impacts the meridians, as you say, the lymph circulation, the cerebral spinal fluid, so, uh, and a lot of people just have liver, uh, lymph chi stagnation. They're not getting enough movement, partly because we're sitting and looking at screens all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our modern culture is so crazy, everything we do. Yeah, guys, so one of the things I like to do to mitigate that is um, is jump up and down on these mini trampolines. And you can imagine it being a cellular exercise. It's probably the only exercise that you can do that stimulates manually every single cell of your body, trillions of them. Um, no gym workout you do can affect your cells as much as rebounding. And this G-force of jumping up and then that negative G-force going back up flushes your lymphatic system. And your lymphatic system has millions of one-way valves and it's only stimulated through manual stimulation. So those valves can only open like by jumping, you know, playing basketball, running. But the problem with that is that the pounding on your ankles and joints. So jumping up and down on a mini trampoline, I mean, there's a reason why just about every anti-cancer or natural cancer clinic uses rebounding or has rebounding in their protocol. It's a, it's a disease prevention. It increases circulation, increases lymphatic fluid stimulation, increases detoxification. Um, it's just one of the best exercises you could do. And I always thought it was so bizarre that people would rebound. Um, you know, I always thought it was like a 1970s thing, but this thing is cool. These Bellicon rebounders, uh, the legs fold. It uses these flexi bungee ropes instead of springs, so they don't break and they're silent. If you're worried about balance, you can uh, purchase additional accessories where you can have a little bar you hold on to. And I, I can't recommend this highly enough, um, investing in one, one of these things. And someone said recently, like, these things are way overpriced. You don't need to buy these, you know, for $500. 
But I can tell you from personal experience, I tore my ACL doing jujitsu um, uh, many years ago, and I was rebounding at the time with these little um, cheap ones that you get at Walmart. And um, I had to stop because my ACL was torn. I think it was like 89% torn uh, tear um, from the MRI that they did. And uh, I've got this excruciating pain. I could not rebound on these little rebounders for like 50 bucks. And I went through like four of them, you know? So I've spent like $200 on these rebounders. And I just thought, you know, why don't I just spend a couple hundred dollars more and get a real one? And ever since then, I've been able to rebound every single day um, with no problem at all on my knees. So this is just an incredible, incredible um, thing to add to your home, you know? Like you can fold it up, put it underneath your bed for storage, easy storage. So I, I can't recommend these enough. These are my favorite rebounder. Uh, they're the Bellicon. They're available at extremehealthradio.com forward slash six, seven, four. Highly recommend adding this to your daily, your daily self care protocol, um, or at least weekly, a couple times a week. What I like to do is combine it with the sauna and open up and flush that lymphatic system and then sweat all those toxins out. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I do. And I think it's something that could really benefit you as well. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that show. We're going to come back and just do a little recap um, for those of you that are watching live on YouTube, on Facebook. We'll talk about a couple of the concepts for a couple minutes. And um, we'll be right back right after this. Extreme Health Radio is your number one resource for cutting edge biohacks, news, and information about how to upgrade every area of your health. Subscribe to our newsletter so you don't miss a thing. Oh, whoops. I think my mic was turned off there. Um, yeah, I was just telling Daniel before the show that uh, we had about six more emails come in from YouTube taking our, our uh, content off. Um, <laughs> and this is the great reset, guys. Um, this censorship thing is real. And um, it's, it's happening at levels that are just decimating people's businesses. And it's, it's a sad thing. So make sure to sign up to his newsletter, to ours newsletter. We send um, emails out twice a week. Uh, sometimes we do one on Friday, letting you know about a, a show that we have going on. Um, but one of the things that he was talking about during that show, I thought that was really interesting, um, was this idea of story behind food. And, and we talked about it a little bit, but I think it's a fascinating concept to explore a little bit further. Um, and that is like the food that we eat, we have no story behind it. We have no frame of reference upon which to understand what went into the, to, to that food. And when you understand that, like he was saying with the rice, like you have this massive appreciation for the food, the harvesting, what it takes to, um, to, to procure that food from nature. And this understanding of being more involved in the cycles of life, I think that's just incredibly important to understand. And like I mentioned on the show, we see this a lot where we're just completely disconnected from the cycles of life, right? We give birth in hospitals under anesthesia, pain medication, under morphine, completely drugged up, and that's how we come into the world. And then after we're in the world, we get fed a series of lies through the programming of our culture, through the mass media, um, through friends and family, through media of every kind, the entertainment industry, and then finally through school. And that sort of re, re supports this idea that we're disconnected from nature. And then we go through life and we think that we can just be addicted to our cell phones and be on computers all the time and live inside these uh, cages, these electrified cages that Daniel talked about. And then we wonder where our food comes from, or we wonder, we realize how dependent we are on the, on the system. And so I, I just, I think it's one of those things that we really have to take stock of, you know, um, for me as well too, because, you know, when he was talking, I was really excited about all the things that he's doing, but there's a part of me also that thinks like, gosh, I don't know if I could do that. You know, we have two twins, you know, two year old boys and, you know, but it's, it's, it's something that I think where he, he said in multiple times on our podcast that it's really important for us to start somewhere, whether that's getting some chickens, whether that's growing some fruit trees in your backyard and just, 
starting somewhere. And I think that's super, super important. I find it fascinating that during this time, everyone's becoming a prepper, right? They're talking about food shortages happening. They're talking about the supply chain breaking down and farmers not being able to dis distribute the food um, to, to places. And it's just, um, it's, it's fascinating to, to see that. And I think that's really important for us to, to take stock of that and ask ourselves, where are we getting our food from? You know, maybe the first step is going from conventional grown, conventional meat to grass fed meat. And then going for, you know, from that to wild food and then going from that, you know, continually take these steps. And Daniel's a guy that I could talk to for hours upon hours. Cause you know, this whole idea of the hunt that I, I'm fascinated by how he's able to go out there, how long, you know, what skills are necessary. Um, there's a really great guy that I'd recommend reading his books. His name's uh, Tom Brown. And he wrote a book called The Tracker years ago. And before my trip around the world in 2001, I read his book uh, called The Vision. And that was a fascinating, fascinating read. And it got it more into the spiritual, emotional aspects of, of reconnecting um, to nature. And I think that it would be a worthy read. So go on the Amazon and, um, and, and look for The Vision by Tom Brown. Um, one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, really, really fascinating. And I think this idea of reconnecting through nature, to nature, through food is so important. And reconnecting with the cycles of life. Because like I said on the podcast, I think that the more we don't do that, the more neurotic, the more anxiety we have, the more time we spend inside, the more time we spend looking at um, these devices like computers, the more our, our vision goes, we get exposed to blue light on our thyroid that's breaking tissue down. We get exposed to all of this high intensity frequency blue light that's destroying melatonin levels, um, not counting the EMF in your walls, I mean, and the toxins in your carpet and just being in, indoors. So what does that mean for you? Like, does that mean finding a way to put your desk outside and maybe working outside on your laptop instead of indoors or sleeping outside in a tent in your backyard a couple of nights a week. Or, I mean, think about that stat that I think it was in the 90% of time that we're awake, we're, we're, we're spending indoors and we wonder why we're sick. We wonder why we're disconnected from life. We wonder why we, we have anxiety. We wonder why all these things are happening, but, it, but the answer is, is simple is reconnect to nature. That's the answer. And that means like lots of different things, reconnecting to ourselves and to the natural world and, you know, around us. That means reconnecting to our family, because this is a big deal, reconnecting to our family, reconnecting to friends and other people and to our environment and to our mission. And I think this time during the COVID era where people are indoors, I mean, a lot of people, there's sort of two groups and two camps of what's, what's happening. You know, some people are just numbing the pain even more and they're spending time watching Netflix and watching, you know, movie after movie on Netflix. And some people are actually doing things they've never done before. They're having experiences they've never had before. They're learning new skills and they're reconnecting to who they actually are. And I think that's the biggest thing that people don't want to do. And this idea of connection is so massive, you know, because it, it's a lack of connection that's causing all of our diseases and all of our, our, our war and strife in the world. It's a lack of connection. It's a lack of a connection to ourselves. And if you think about even diseases like tumors and cancers and things, that's a, a disconnection, right? We're so disconnected that God has to hit us over the head with a hammer um, to wake us up and to feel like we're actually connected. And this idea of destroying a tumor or destroying something in our life that gets in our way, this has all been taught to us, you know, and we don't have to do that. When you include the tumor and realize the tumor is your body's actual healing process going on, you know, that's the body actually healing itself. When you include that as part of your process and lovingly allow it to leave your body, that's a much deeper and more powerful way to heal than it is to cut, burn and destroy and to kill and to do all these treatments. And this, this sort of applies to any sort of health condition as well. And it all gets down to like, who are we? You know, why are we eating this way? Why do we want to be healthy? Why do we want to um, do the things we're doing? Are we doing things that our body says that we should do? 
Are we living our life's mission? Are we doing the things that actually make us happy? Are we doing those things? And look at Daniel. I mean, he's so stoked. He's so happy to be doing what he's doing because he's, he's teaching people, but he would be doing it anyway. And it just so happens to include many awesome health practices, like he talked about forest bathing and getting natural sunlight on his skin and his photoreceptors on his skin, um, reconnecting by eating natural wild food local to his environment that's fresh. I mean, all of these things he'd be doing anyway, but it's, it's awesome that he's sort of set up a, an existence where he can also be paid for that by pu you know, putting out content and selling some products and stuff. And, you know, I encourage all of us to do that because when our time is manipulated and controlled by forces outside of ourselves, it really becomes a challenge for us to be able to do anything that we want to do. And I highly encourage all of us to figure out a way to, to make a living outside of the matrix and outside of having to trade our time for money and figuring out what we can do to add value to the world. See, that's really what it comes down to is, is how can I produce something, whether it's a podcast or whether it's a book or whether it's a, a DVD series or it's a media series or some content or a product that's going to help people and solve some problems. Um, and there's tremendous growth in going through that entrepreneurial process. And I, I highly recommend it if you're inclined that way. Um, I really do because the amount of growth that comes from the process itself, just like Daniel with, with going out and hunting and foraging food, like the amount of growth and the appreciation and the reconnection with nature is just through the roof. It's not something that you get going to the grocery store in the same way with starting a, you know, a business. Like there's lots of growth opportunities there, um, becoming more organized and figuring out what people want, learning marketing and sales and learning all this kind of stuff that helping to reconnect with people, having your finger on the pulse of what people want so you can solve their problems. You know, I think right now we're in such a tremendous time where humanity can go one of two ways. And it's up to us to really look within and start thinking about our lives in terms of like, how can we make the world a better place? How can we get involved in something that's gonna feed my soul and feed my spirit and allow us to, um, to do the things we're supposed to be doing. Cause we all know deep down really what we're supposed to be doing. And I think we keep ourselves busy and we distract ourselves and we numb the pain with media and entertainment so that we never have to really focus on, on that. But somehow deep within ourselves, as we're driving to work or as we're driving around where there, there's this sadness and there's this despair that we want to be doing something different, but we just don't know what. And the reason why we don't know what is because we're so busy with everything that we put up in our lives, not just our responsibilities, but then the time outside of the responsibilities. I think that um, we deliberately keep ourselves busy through entertainment. So we never have to face those deeper questions. And like Daniel was talking about, this is how our ancestors lived, reconnecting with food uh, to nature and understanding the cycles of life. And I don't know why I got on this whole t you know, topic after the show, but I just felt like maybe one of you or someone else needed to hear that. Because typically the thing that you know, we're dealing with is, 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 is all the same thing and something that I need to deal with. So I just felt like it was imperative to share that and maybe that helps one or two of you reconnect with your own mission, figure out who you are, why you're here, what you're doing, where you're going to have a frame of reference that you can stand upon and be sure about and be strong about. Um, you know, I think this is really important. And I think that it would behoove all of us to remove those things in our life that are distractions, whether they're relationships, jobs, people, entertainment and, uh, and friends and family that constantly distract us. And I think that when you strip all those things away, and you start having to face who you are and what your goals are and, and who you really are at the deepest levels and understanding that we're all connected, we're all one. And I, I think that's an incredibly powerful place to be. So anyway, uh, big rant there. I hope you enjoyed the show. Go check out Wild Fed, um, wild-fed.com. Follow Daniel and his work. Uh, cool guy. Oh, I wanted to tell you about... Um, so he's got a separate company called Sir Thrival, and 
there is a discount go code going on right now, which um, let me find out what that is. I think it's, um, I thought I put it in the show notes. If it's not on the show notes, um, I'll bring it up and I'll find out what it is. So if you go through our link, if you go to biochargeme.com, um, you, you should see you should see a coop or um, his his products. Okay, so right now he's got um, 15%. Let me do this real quick. I actually sent this to a friend of mine. Okay, so he's got 15% off until, let's see, October 31st, Halloween 2020 at 1159 p.m. Eastern time. So... That's 8.59 p.m. Pacific time. And the coupon code is healthy gut, all one word. Um, but go through our link, if you would, at biochargeme.com and you'll get 15% off, let's see, what has he got? 15% off colostrum and digestive bitters. So any kind of colostrum you get, um, it will be available. They have the capsules and the two, ki uh, two kilo uh, different options. Um, Great products. I love, love, love his stuff over at Sir Thrival. So make sure to go check that out. 15% off if you go through biochargeme.com and go to just type in Sir Thrival and you'll find all the different products that we have listed on biochargeme.com. And then um, and then you'll be able to click on over. And when you click over, that supports our work. Nothing happens sort of on your end. It's just that he gives us a little commission from your order and that helps support the show that we do. And that way you get a little discount and make sure to use the code healthy gut. Um, also, don't forget to check out the Relax Far Infrared Sauna, uh, the Green Wave Dirty Electricity Filters, the Stockton Aloe One, and the Bellicon Rebounders. Make sure to check those out. And um, last but not least, I wanted to tell you guys about our academy. Um, so in our academy, I highly recommend you join. Um, it's an awesome, awesome place. So every Friday morning, we do a live Zoom room, and that's... Um, that's a lot of fun. I love getting to know everybody in there and our regular members, and it's just an awesome, awesome opportunity for that. So, um, and then we have courses, we have workshops, we have Q and A sessions every single month, uh, weekly meetings. It's uh, an incredible forum where um, I'm in there every single day. I think I've posted three thousand times in the forum. I just figure that out. So if you guys would like access to the Academy for a free two week trial and you want to take your health further, you want to get answers to your health. Um, one of my sort of gifts I would say is, is having such a broad range of information and knowledge from different locations and different people and practitioners and different, um, protocols and different systems of healing and aggregating that together in a way that's, um, you know, easily feasible and, and applicable to you. And so, um, if you want to work with me and get my thoughts on your conditions, anything like that, I can definitely share lots of really great information um, inside the forums there. So go to extremehealthacademy.com and then use the code EHR, Extreme Health Radio. So it's EHR14 for a free two week trial. Come and say hello in the forums and uh, we can work further together. I can meet you in person in the Zoom rooms or digitally, I should say. Um, and we get to have a great time. I get to help you on your health journey. So um, really appreciate you guys being here. I'll put links to everything I talked about at extremehealthradio.com forward slash 674. That's today's show, 674. Um, all right, guys. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And I'll see you next week. I think we have next week, let me see who we got. Adam Bergstrom, Mind Hacking and Body Language. Uh, and then Dr. Gerald Smith, Missing Links and Degenerative Diseases. Dr. Richard Massey, Celebrating Our Origin Stories. Morley Robbins, Does Iron Deficiency Anemia Really Exist? Um, so as you can imagine, we have such access to so many amazing people. Um, and this is sort of my gift is to be able to bring all of these great ideas into a system that can help you heal then and that's what we do inside the academy so make sure to subscribe to our show on youtube for as long as we're on youtube before they kick us up off hopefully not and uh, make sure to check out our store biochargeme.com and most importantly come over to the community and just start your free two-week trial and say hello and i can uh, i'd love to help you and meet you and all that good stuff. All right, guys, love you so much. Have a great weekend. And uh, for those that are Academy members, I'll see you all weekend long in the forums. Um, and if you're a radio show listener, I'll see you next Friday with Adam Bergstrom in episode 675. All right, thanks, guys. Love you so much. Talk to you soon.
No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be dangerous to take action based on any information in this blog or to start any health program without first consulting a health professional. The content found here is for informational purposes only and is in no way intended as medical advice, as a substitute for medical counseling, or as a treatment slash cure for any disease or health condition, and nor should it be continued as such. Always work with a qualified healthcare professional before making any changes to your diet, prescription drug use, lifestyle, or exercise activities. This information is provided as is, and the reader slash viewer assumes